we're just setting up. Sorry if it's a little um, awkward. I am here. Hi, hi. We're trying to get some lighting fixed. Uh, last time where someone talked to us, that light on that one, is, is that a problem? Or is that just a reflection? Oh, that's a, that's a light. I think, do people see that or do I? Is the lighting, if you're on YouTube, leave us a comment. Let us know if the lighting is bad or bothering you. Last time people said it was bothering, but I don't think this is terrible. Yeah, I think this is okay. But let us know. Um, somebody wrote something. Yeah, let me pull up over here. Hi, Becky. Hi, Paula. <laughs> I'm just getting going. Um, I thought when, as I was starting to talk, and always remember if you miss this part, um, I'm just kind of talking about kind of family life update thing. Um, and so you can always go back and watch it. It's not that big of a deal. And again, we're trying to stream from Facebook and from YouTube at the same time. So if I look at one camera or the other camera, please forgive me. I'm trying to do the best I can because we have so many people that want to use one or the other platforms and so we're just trying to accommodate as many people as we can donna says the lighting is good yay was she from youtube yep okay good okay so i thought um well first off welcome i'm at my kitchen we're at the kitchen island everything at my house happens at the kitchen island and so um it looks like calissa is going to have to let the dogs out you don't you're not seeing her she's just off camera calissa wave and say hi so everybody can say I'm not camera ready. Right, she's not camera ready. <laughs> I don't know that I'm camera ready either. I mean, who are we trying to fool? I'm not really camera ready. But um, this is Juno. Juno is a little puppy that I'm fostering now. I just am fostering her for a couple days. Um, the One of the girls that coordinates a lot of the foster care, she got in some new pups. And um, Juno's older. And we just wanted to not have her she's not older like she's only i don't know 15 weeks old maybe maybe only maybe only about that old i'm just taking a stab i don't really know for sure to be honest maybe she's only about 12 weeks old but juno already has a home she's just waiting for her family to be ready to get her a lot of the families that adopt from us from our rescue they like to pick up the puppies on friday night or saturday so that they can have a couple days where they're not trying to work and take care of the pup at the same time and so um juno already has her home she'll be going to her home on saturday or it's actually a meet and greet but most of the time the families even though they do do a meet and greet they do keep the pups because I wonder if this camera over here if that should be slid more this way if that might help with the light a little bit too if the whole it's just no. function it's fine but it just slide the whole underneath part okay I'll be honest it's just an old box that the camera is sitting on because we don't we've have bought in so many fancy cameras and <laughs> yeah it that's just better that's better because it was just kind of further back yeah I think that's so anyway, this sweet little girl's name is Juno. She's an Australian Shepherd pup. She came to us with um, two siblings and then some from another litter that came from the same farm. And so here she is and she's getting ready to go. And after um, Juno goes home, then on Saturday, I'm gonna be getting two Australian Shepherds that are toy Australian Shepherds and they will be like a brown color and if you've watched or listened to my blog before or watched the blog read the blog yep <laughs> Rusty is their dad and Rusty was uh, Australian Shepherd that was the brown red color so Juno's really cute she's got different eyes and she's got a cute coloring of her nose she's a pretty cute dog so anyway whoever gets her is really lucky she's super soft and so far she's been doing really really well so Calissa do you want to grab her and put her back in her pen and then I'll start grabbing some questions yeah. you are so sweet oh okay are we ready to go um First off, Calissa and I are very frustrated with ourselves. Remember, we're new to this and we don't really understand everything and how to do it. And it really takes a while for um, somebody who's new at something to learn all the tricks in the, of the trade. 
So we had published some YouTube videos. I kind of did the videos and Calissa does the editing and then she put them on YouTube. And for those who of you that don't know, when you see ads on YouTube, that means that the person who put together the video that you're watching, they're probably getting paid for the ads that, if you see an ad, they're probably getting a little bit of money um, and that's how they can um, afford to spend the time and the money to do videos. Um, now she's coming to adjust something else. It's just the YouTube camera. You can continue. Okay. Well, anyway, so the people are getting a little bit of money from that. And so I am set up that way as well. So that if you're watching this video later on YouTube and you see an ad, um, it, it just helps me pay for, Oh, some of the platforms and the stuff that I have to do on the blog. I know that some of you do follow my blog, Joe's Country Junction. And there, if you've noticed, a lot of you have been getting a an email newsletter. And um, that email newsletter, it costs me about $50 a month for me to be able to send that newsletter out. And so the ads and stuff like that just help recoup some of those costs. So I don't have to actually pay for it. It just is um, something that... Um, you guys end up paying for honestly by watching the ads. So that's where that is. Well, we didn't know, we pushed that we wanted ads in the video. Well, I was doing the So With Joe videos and somebody said, there's so many ads in your video. And they left a comment saying that. And we went and we watched the video and holy mackerel, I would have not watched my video because there was like so many ads. We had absolutely no idea. What we think we figured out is, is if I quit talking and I ran something through the sewing machine, they would stop and put an ad in there. And so we have um, disabled that kind of ad and we'll be trying to figure out how to do ads better. But I sincerely apologize and I sincerely appreciate everyone who put up with that. But please, 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 if something like that happens, let us know because we really do want to know. We really want to make it a good viewing um, platform for you. So she keeps tweaking with my cameras. I think she's thinking the lighting is going to get better. So yeah. So anyway, once again, Calissa and I, thank you very much. And thank you for letting us know that so many ads were happening because we don't want that. And um, we appreciate any good feedback that you ever send our way. Um, some feedback that we get is kind of awkward, but that feedback is fabulous and I never mind it at all. Yeah, and she's put it in a very nice way. She was very polite about how she told us to. <laughs> yes, yes. The lady was wonderful who let us know and we really appreciate it. So yeah, thank you very much. And like I said, we're learning and we're trying to get better and better at this. So. Fingers crossed, we'll actually get better at it. Um, is this the one, this, is this lighting right here an issue? Maybe people don't even see that. See that light right there. I don't think people see it. If you see it on YouTube, let me know and I'll fix it again. I just, we need better camera stands. You guys would laugh if you saw what we're using right now. Um, we're using an up, uh, UPS box. Or, and an iron. <laughs> and an iron <laughs> to help support the camera. And it's at a terrible angle because it's showing my double chin. I know. I'm trying to fix the <laughs> angle. I'm trying to. So I've been looking at this camera because this one doesn't show my double chin. Not this camera because this one does show my double chin. <laughs> So, I don't know. What can we boost it with? I don't know. I'm walking around your house trying to figure it out. You can answer a couple questions. I'll keep okay. working on it. People are going to get annoyed with us. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we are filming this, and um, Kayla says she's on Facebook, and the lighting looks great. Okay. Hi, Kayla. Kayla's my second daughter. Um, Calissa, who's here with me tonight, she is my last daughter or third daughter or the youngest child she's all of those things wrapped up in one and she's very helpful for me too and i really very much appreciate that what about the other box that's there on the table or that chest set that's underneath that oh yes that would probably be a good thing so now she, <laughs> now she has a little red chair i'm so distracted she's running around here's the little red chair she can try the little red chair see if that will boost us up um i promise i'll buy another kind of stand or something that will make this be a little bit more efficient so that my double chin it's it's complete vanity i don't want my double chin to show <laughs> okay answer question mom answer question okay so um, I don't have a listing of who asked this question, but I know it came. That can't work, can it? Oh. Mm -hmm. Hi. 
That is much better. Yeah, I don't, I don't see my double chin quite so Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I look good in both of them. I don't know which camera to look at. I'm just teasing. <laughs> This is totally not me. <laughs> this, is, this is camera giggles. It happens. It's true. Um, so my first question is, do I pre-starch my fabrics? Absolutely, positively, no. I never pre-starch any fabrics. Um, I did the... There was a quilt along that uh, Primitive Gatherings had, and you're only supposed to cut strips like an inch wide, and she told everybody that they had to pre-starch um, the fabrics and... I never did. If you're if you're picky and if you really like to pre-starch your fabrics, hey, go for it. But I'm just I have such little time to sew that I don't want to get wrapped up in um, having to do too many steps before I actually get to the machine. So I do not pre-starch at all. But I'm kind of the rebel quilter. I you know I almost think I should get a shirt that says rebel quilter because so many of the things that I do aren't things you're supposed to do. So I'm like the anti-quilting police, I guess you would probably say. So anyway, that's my question to that. I absolutely positively do not starch my fabrics. So do you have a question for me? You kind of look like you did. Uh, nope, not okay. yet. No questions. And please ask questions. I don't have that many questions tonight. So please, please, please ask a question if you have one. Um, Laura was wondering if I would discuss or demo how you give quilt tops a final press, especially since you said you do not press while piecing. Thank you. Um, here's where I'm getting in trouble and my Rebel Quilter is coming out yet again um, because I have several questions here that are all regarding how I press and what I do when I press. Hi, Izzy. Izzy's right down here. Um, so I'm gonna show you something and this is my true confession. Um, because here I'll ask the next question too, because it regards this too. Donna says, how do you handle pressing when you piece a quilt? Do you press after each step, wait until it's all together, or does the kind of block you're piecing dictate what you do? If you wait until the top is pieced before pressing, do you worry about which way the seam allowance lays? If you press a seam allowance open or press it to one side, which, which way do I do it? Um, I, she said she's been working through some of this herself, but she would love to hear my thoughts and she finds my insights very helpful. And so my basic answer to this is I don't think there's a right and I don't think there's a wrong. If you, um, or anyone else probably accept me, you probably worry about pressing. I do not wor worry about pressing at all. So I have a little something I wanna explain to you first before I get into that so that you can understand my reasoning for what I do. So some people, they would go, oh, look at this beautiful table runner I did. I worked so hard on this. I got all of my fabric from here and I got all of my fabric from there and it was a wonderful fabric bundle. I'm not making fun of anybody, but we all know people who do that. You know, they, they very think about the process. And there's a lot of people who are very methodical when they sew and they want it to be a perfect way. And then there are also people who sew just to sew. And there's people that like, don't even really like to sew but they like to have the finished thing in, in their home. So like if I was somebody like that, I probably wouldn't know a lot about the process of how I did it. I just want this in my house and I don't really care about how it got here. I just want it made and that's what I do. So um, when I was doing childcare, they call that process versus product. So the process people, they like to, get into the process of how it's done and they like it to be very methodical and they like they and they don't really care so much about their piece when it's done and then there's process there's product people who just love having this in their home so you have to kind of decide where you fit into the gamut of that are you a process person do you love the process are you a product person do you love the product and i'll be honest um i'm somewhere in between I, I, if I give a quilt to someone, I want the quilt to be used. If I give somebody a quilt for a wedding present, I hope in 10 years the quilt is completely and totally shot. I, I hope that there's, the binding needs to be replaced. 
I, I hope that they totally use the quilt. I, I would prefer they don't abuse it, you know, but I really prefer that they use the quilt. And when I give the gift, it's their gift. I'm done with it. I'm not upset if something happens to it. Um, I purposely um, do a lot of um, long arm quilting into baby quilts because I want them to be used. I want the baby to throw up on them. I want, well, I don't want the baby to throw up, but if the baby throws up, I don't care if it's on the quilt. Mama wash it, you know, it's all fine. And that's kind of how I feel about that. You look like you have a question. No, I just made a poll in the comments on Facebook and asked if you're a process quilter or a project quilt, or what is it? Product. Product. Yeah, process, process or, or product. product. Which one are you? So I, I want people to use quilts, but a lot of people, when they give quilts, they want the quilts hung up on the wall. They want the people to look at the quilt. They want the people to act reverent towards the quilt. That is totally not me. I really want the quilt to be used. So um, that's why I can easily give a lot of quilts away because my enjoyment mostly came back when I was making the quilt and I love making the quilt. And for me, if I get too picky about the making process, I don't enjoy it. So that's why I limit the amount that I, of time I spent at the iron. That's the way I, that's why I don't starch my products or my fabric before I get going. I, I don't, I don't, care about that. The thing and the enjoyment I get out of sewing is sitting down at the machine and piecing the pieces through. And I don't have to think about my grandson who's sick. I don't have to think about that he had double ear infection today on top of everything that he's got going on. That's Calissa's little boy, Gannon, if you've been following along because he, we found out he's got double ear infection today. I don't have to worry about all those things because I'm just like in the zone and sewing. And that's why I sew. I, I, what people make a joke and say, sewing is cheaper than therapy. And it's really not cheaper than therapy. <laughs> Most therapy at least gets some insurance out of it. But um, I want something methodical. I want something to take my mind um, off the bad weather that's coming. No, we're not getting bad weather, but that's what I'm just using that as an example. I really like sitting at the machine and just pushing the pieces through. Some people say things like, I don't want to make a Bonnie Hunter quilt because she tells you you need 527 half square triangles. And I'm in the background going, 527 triangles, bring it on. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. I'm going to be able to block out all the other things that are happening in my life and I'm going to be able to peacefully sew. And that's what I love. But back to my ironing. Okay, so you see this right here? At the same time that I was making this, and this is just made out of a bunch of bonus um, triangles, and then I had this awesome um, tulle fabric that I put on the back on the backing, but this was just all bonus triangles. I sat down, I already had all the triangles made, and I just sewed them together because I wanted like a little Christmassy table runner. Well, I went back upstairs and was gonna make another one to go in another spot in my house, and so I sewed these all together and I have them all together in a strip. And then I ironed it because I was gonna take it to the long arm and I never finished it. But I want you to look at this back. Every seam goes every which way. A lot of you like are curling up and going, what the heck, Joe Kramer, what are you doing? Why are you not ironing nicely and beautifully? You see this? The seams are all, Every which way wonky, no seam is pressed open. No seam is pressed at all, hardly. And I did press it because look at the front, it's flat. But look at the back. The pieces are all just every, every other which way. There's no rhyme or reason to how it landed. When I took it, I laid it out like this. I sprayed it with spray starch because I do use spray starch in the end when my top is finished. I sprayed it and I ironed it. I do never, I never use steam um, and I just ironed it. And I would happily take this to the long arm and long arm it and look, this is how it will turn out. Can you tell that my seams in the back are all wonky? No, there's nothing to tell that the seams are all wonky in the back. So I don't worry about it. 
I don't worry about it whatsoever at all. But if you want to worry about that, if you want to care about which way your seams are pressed, if you want to do all of that, you can do that however you want to do it. But I just want you to know there's a whole lot of people out there like me who don't care. And your quilt will turn out just fine. Because seriously, this is exactly, exactly, you just don't even need to worry about it. So that's what I have to tell you about how I final press anything or how I press when I do press. I do have a couple more examples of things I have. Girls. <laughs> this is my dogs right down here. Hey, girls. Hey. Like Calissa says, you both have pretty purses. <laughs> She did tell my dogs that one time. Um, so this is a little strip I have left over from my Iowa Hawkeyes quilt. When I sewed these half square triangles together, girls, um, I did press those, but I didn't, being that they're all just light and dark, I didn't distinguish which way that they needed to be pressed. I just pressed them and I pressed them to one direction. I, I rarely, if ever, press open. Um, here's some blocks I did for a little piece. Um, here's my pressing on the back. I actually did really good here. Aren't you so proud of me? And that's for a little quilt that I did. And so I didn't press until this four patch was sewn together. And then I didn't press again. I saw this four patch once it was all sewn together, I pressed. This four patch once it was sewn all together, I pressed. And then I sewed them to the squares I can't even use my words and then I sewed the two scripts strips together and then I pressed and I actually did look at me that's pretty good that that's way better than I normally do um here's a block that Kelly made um Kelly is a little bit better of a presser but you can see here this is wonky oh show both cameras thank you um yes here I didn't show this to this camera so you can see and you can see I did a pretty good job, but so like this and this, I pressed those and then I sewed them to the squares. The dogs are being goofy. Um, this is a block um, from my tulip quilt that was in American Patchwork and Quilting last spring, probably about this time of year. I, I'll admit, I tried a little harder on this because it was next to white. So I tried to make sure as, as often as I could, I didn't press to the white. Um, but even still, I mean, this is okay pressing on the bottom, but in the top it got kind of busy. And I did press this seam open because so many things were coming together right here. Dogs! Hey, girls, in your kennel. Here, come on. Izzy. Izzy, do you just want to say hi? Say hi, Izzy. Okay, now go. Be nice, Rosie. <laughs> okay. Um, here's another one uh, orphan block that I brought down. This is Kelly's. Um, she pressed like this. Uh, we honestly aren't big, fabulous pressers. And for the most part, I don't worry about it very much because most of the time I'm the one that long arms my quilt. Sometimes um, Carla Burst of Long Arm Quilting Inspirations, she um, does most of our quilts that go into magazines. And Carla is very sweet to me and she doesn't make fun of me for my backing and I very much appreciate that for Carla. So if you are somebody who doesn't press super well, um, Carla's your girl <laughs> because she she won't make fun of you and she'll be just fine with however you press your quilt. Um, I know that she prefers people that, obviously she prefers if the quilt will lay flatter, but she's dealt with mine and you can see how terrible mine are. So um, I recommend Carla. So a couple comments. Um, I did tag Carla's long arm quilting inspiration in the comments on Facebook, so you can find that and follow her there. Um, we have actually a lot of questions and comments. Um, let's see, Becky Clay, hello. Hi, Amy, Becky. Amy Paulson, hello. Hi, Amy. Those are like our top two. Um, people that number follow one the supporters. blog. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> I really appreciate it. So does Calissa. Yes. Because I know um, you follow us both. Yes. And I had my questions up. Um, Mar Marianne Wells, what is your favorite thread to quilt with on your long arm? Do you wind your own bobbins or use pre-wound? I mostly use, uh, what is it called? Baby, is it baby lock? 
thread. And the reason I use it, come on guys, I'm cheap. Um, it's only about $3 for a spool. And I will tell you that it is a little dustier than most fabrics. I do like Superior, but um, I'm a cheapskate and I can buy the other cones for like $3 a thing. Maxi Lock, that's what it is, Maxi Lock. So I was at the quilt uh, store one day right after I got my long arm and I was looking for a specific color of thread and the gal that was helping me was the gal that does the long arm for them and she goes hey this is the exact thread color that you were talking about and I looked at it and I flipped it over upside down and I said well this is max block thread I said I thought that was searcher thread she goes it is but we use it sometimes and I went what I don't have to pay $17 for a spool or a cone of thread I can just buy this maxi lock and she said yeah, she goes, you might have to clean your machine a little more often because it is a dustier thread. Uh, I think it's it has more cotton content in it. And so it does create more dust in the bottom. But I just clean my machine out every time after I um, do a quilt. And then I just pay the $3. So that's what I get. That's what I use. Um, I, I do love Superior. I love King Tut. Um, but um, I use Maxi Lock. Okay. Um... Do you ever wash new fabric before using? Um, the only washed new fabric I ever use is something that somebody already sent me. I don't wash it myself. Wait, I do take that back. I will wash red if it's going to be the backing of a quilt and I put color catchers in there. And I occasionally will pick up something from the thrift store that might have a funky smell or I might pick up something that has a lot of, like a vintage piece of fabric that has red, I for sure wash that and put color catchers in there. But just the regular uh, fabric that I'm piecing with, I do not wash first. So, and I don't care if I've washed the backing fabric and I haven't washed the top fabric, it doesn't bother me at all. So some people care about that, I don't really care about that. Dorothy Countryman on Facebook. I'm going to make the Moment of Zen quilt you designed. I purchased a fat quarter bundle of cider. Do you suggest starching the fabric before cutting? Also, any pointers you can give me before I start? I adore that quilt. Here's the pointer that I'm going to give you. If you're going to have the quilt published in a national magazine, don't twist one of the blocks and sew the block the long way and then long arm it and then send it to the magazine and then look at it in the magazine and see that it's published and the block is actually twisted. Um, so <laughs> that's what happened to me. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed by that. And I just made a true confession. Um, <laughs> so that's what happened. I was sewing that quilt. One of the corners of the block got twisted and then, um, it got sewn into the quilt that way. And it was published in national magazine that way. So I'm sure some of you maybe caught it, but I didn't get a lot of flack and feedback from that. So I'm sure quite a few of you didn't um, catch that either. Um, if you bought a, a fat quarter bundle, I, I, again, I don't starch any of my fabric ever. Um, I hardly even iron it. I mean, if, if there's a big crease in it from the, from it being a fat quarter, or if you unwrap it, I'll iron those out, but I'm not super picky. I'm just so not super picky. I remember, I want to get to the machine and I want a methodically piece. Where do you get inspiration for finishing your cross stitch, like frames, pin cushion, etc.? Um, I watch a lot of other floss tubers, um, and they're so good. I follow quite a few people on Instagram. Um, the longer I've done it, the more I just I feel braver. Um, I think anytime anyone starts something new, it's always easy to back away or feel shy because you haven't done it before. But in reality, the more I do it, the more comfortable I feel. So then the more adventurous I get. So um, basically um, find some Instagram people to follow. Um, that's awesome. And find some floss tubers to follow. I've done a blog post on that before of floss tubers that I follow. And so you can look up that list on the blog. So you just go to www.joescountryjunction.com and there's a search bar. And in the search bar, you could just write floss tube. And I'm sure a blog post will come up that tells you about floss tubers that I watch. All right. This was asked, we are giving priority to questions that were asked beforehand, just because that helps us kind of prep a little bit too. 
Um, so Sue Ann Ballard asks from Idaho, what are your thoughts on irons? Seems like they are fancy and too costly. <clears throat> I got a new Black & Decker Classic iron for Christmas. Simple, stays hot, good grip, under $35. Good for me. Merry Christmas from Snow Country. Okay. If we have snow here too. Um, we've had uh, snow over the last couple, uh, over the last week. We were even in a blizzard warning for two days. Um, not that we got a ton of snow, but it was really blowing. But back to your iron question, I do exactly what you did. I do not buy um, expensive irons. I happen to have my... Um, downstairs iron right here and this happens to be a shark um, I didn't spend a lot of money for it maybe $40 and that's usually out of my realm typically I buy my irons at the thrift store for three dollars and then when they die I throw them away and then I go to the thrift store and I find another iron for three dollars and I throw them away it just so happened when this iron died I didn't I was at thrift store and I did not have a replacement iron and to be honest, the cheaper irons, if you don't put steam in them or don't put water in them and don't use steam with them, they will last a pretty good amount of time. And they're about the hottest iron you can ever get. And I like it hot. So when I do iron, it actually does go flat on that rare occasion I iron. Margie Young. Hi, Joe. What type of batting and quilting thread do you use? Do you use the same thread in the bobbin? Um, I do use the same thread in the bobbin and in the top when I'm long arming. Um, what kind of batting do I use? I use warm and natural and um, 80 20. Um, I use also Hobbs 80 20. Um, I also get the Pellon brand 80 20 and I use that for charity quilts. It's quite a lot cheaper and um, I just, I don't. People have um, bashed me for this before. I don't put the most expensive things in charity quilts because I don't know what's gonna happen with the quilts. I don't like downgrade and make them cheap, but I don't upgrade them and make them really fancy smancy. Because some of these quilts like might be going to a foster kid and they're not allowed to take it to their next home. Some of these things might be going to somebody who had a house fire and they used the blanket or I mean, I'm sorry, the quilt for as long as they needed it. And then once they got the house the way they wanted it and it didn't match somebody's bedroom, they passed the quilt on. So for me, I just, I'll buy Pellon 80-20 and that's what I get for most of my um, people who do charity quilting as well. I use Pellon for those, and but I use Warm and Natural for myself because I like how it drapes a little better. So, okay. And as far as thread, when I'm um, piecing at my sewing machine, I use whatever thread some blog reader sent to me that they no longer want. And I get a lot of thread that's sent to me and I get like cones of thread and I just use that in my machine. And as long as it's a fairly neutral color, I don't really care what kind of thread I use in my, sheet, my machine for piecing. What is the difference between Ada cloth, linen, and open weave? An even weave. I think I mean even weave. Okay. So Ada cloth is fabric that um, it has the pieces that are kind of woven together and then they have a hole in the corner like this but this center piece is kind of like a bigger lump and they have two holes right here um, linen it is just straight up and down the warp and the weft and you can see the holes between them and when you have linen like I have a piece of linen right here um, it's not one thing with, with true linen they have slubs in there and so slubs are kind of like a fat not all of the pieces of the warp and the weft are the same thickness when you have linen. So sometimes you might have a little fat thing there, or you might have a little blob of, of linen fabric that has kind of made a little bunch, and that's usually called a slub. And so that's the difference. So if you're gonna sew stitch on linen, you usually stitch over two threads. So you go two threads up and two threads over and put your needle down. And then, you know, the two threads up and two threads over is how you always do it. Um, unless you're stitching over one. What? Izzy is chewing on your kitchen island. Oh, Izzy. <laughs> I was like, what is that sound? Izzy. And even weave is kind of, um, it's, you handle it like linen. The only thing is, is that it's made out of more processed th threads so that there's not those slubs and there's not those thin spots and the wide spots. 
if you are a brand new stitcher um, and you want to eventually get to be where you're stitching on linen, then I suggest going to even weave first. Um, like a 28 count even weave is probably what I would suggest for you. Um, if you want something to look like an old antique, um, it's really only going to look like an old antique if you stitch on probably 36 or 40 count. Um, it'll look good on other things as well, but if you really want it to look like it actually came from an antique shop, then you're going to probably need a 40 or 36 count linen. Okay, this is a long question, but it's a good one. I enjoy the process and the product. This is from Cynthia. However, I have a number of tops that need to be quilted. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do with them. If I'm going to gift them or for a certain bed, they don't get quilted because it's expensive. I don't think I'm a person who would enjoy doing her own quilting. I'm not going to buy a long arm and I'm not going to rent one. And I'm not comfortable trying to quilt anything ex except small projects on my sewing machine. And tying doesn't seem right. Do you have any thoughts or advice about this? I feel stuck. Oh, I can see why you would feel stuck because I was in that same position myself at one point. And so um, I got so like baby quilts I would do on my domestic machine. And then I got a little braver and I did um, lap quilts on my domestic machine. And then when I got to like big bed quilts, I'd still tie them. And I did that for a long time. And like you, I felt like it really wasn't quite the appropriate thing. Um, I guess maybe if you know you're going to gift it, maybe you could ask the person or you could tell the person, this is your gift for two years. Or, you know, this is going to be your, your um, Mother's Day gift, your birthday gift, and your Christmas gift. And then you quilt it for your mother. And if you have like three occasions, you can kind of break out the money that you're gonna spend on long arming it um, to somebody else. Um, if you have somebody who would do a barter system, I know people have done that with me before. They've said, you know, hey, I'll you know, give you a $50 gift certificate if you long arm this quilt for me. And a $50 gift certificate for long arming really isn't a deal, but for me, I mean, it's a deal for them. It's not a deal for me. But for me, going out to eat is a treat, and so I would happily barter something. So if you have somebody with a long arm, maybe you could um, see if there's something that they're willing to barter to make it a little bit more affordable. Um, let me think. You can donate them to charity. Um, if, if you want to give a quilt away for a benefit, you can always contact the people who are putting together a benefit and ask if they know somebody who might donate their long arming services. I know sometimes Carla of Long Arm Quilting Inspirations and, and I, we both live in the same area and um, have a lot of the same causes in mind. So I might say, hey, Carla, I've got a top, but I don't have time. Um, could we donate this together to the benefit if you would long arm it? Because I already have the top done and I have the backing. And Carla's really great and Carla and I will team up together and give something to a benefit. So um, that's about the best I can do to answer that one. Nancy has a plant question. Your African violets look so wonderful. What do you feed them? If the main stem grows into an S shape, what do you do? Okay. Um, my African violets, I do have African violets in this window. I have one here. Um, actually, I had a question from a blog reader. I'm going to grab this one. Um, this is a trailing African violet, and a blog reader gifted this one to me. It's different than a regular African violet. Regular African violets have a crown, and then the leaves come out from the crown. But this one trails, so it basically creates new little branches in a way. And... Um, it keeps growing like this. This thing has been, this is not very many blooms at all. It has been crazily blooming since May and now it's finally slowing down and taking a break. I'm gonna set this back here again. But I had a blog reader comment and ask me if I would give her a slip of my African violet and I will, but right now it's freezing and there's no way we can do that in Iowa right now because it would be in the mail here. And this person lived out in California. I'm sure the weather would produce, a, be fine for a plant where you're at, but where I'm at here, uh, we had 40 below wind chills last week. So there's no way that it would um, last in the mail. So what do I use for, I'm gonna show you one other thing. 
I love these kind of pots for African violets. So this is the bottom part and there's water in there. Whoa. And the plant is in this part right here and this goes into here. And the plant can absorb water <coughs> through the clay of the pot. And so those are called self-watering planters. They're kind of expensive. Um, you can get them for around $20 a pot, which is really expensive if you have a lot of plants. But I got mine years and years and years ago, and I buy them all the time when I find them at thrift stores because this isn't really my favorite pot because it kind of has a, oh, goofy design on it that's not very grown up. But I just turn that design around so I don't see the design and I use the pot because I only spent a dollar for it at the thrift store. But I use African violet soil, potting soil, and I use um, African violet fertilizer. If you go on Amazon and you type in African violet fertilizer, it's a green bottle. That's what I get. And I, I only fertilize them a couple times a year. I love your shirt. Where did you get it? I get these questions all the time. My machinist shirt is a shirt from Calissa's um, company. Are you the pink shoelaces or are I you close to the I am uh, in an identity crisis on Etsy. I am currently, you can search Calissa Georgia. I'll put a link in both of the comments. You guys can check it out. Yeah. So Calissa and I designed some of these shirts. Uh, this shirt we actually designed when we were in the waiting room at Mayo Clinic in Rochester waiting for an appointment for me for um, regarding my cancer issues. And so uh, we found this font and I said, oh, I just love that font. I love the way it's drawn out like that. And I said, we just need a good word underneath it. And we were going, you know, so we're a stitcher and we were thinking all these words. And then Calissa said, machinist. And I thought, yes, that is the exact word. Uh, when we were at a craft show this fall, Calissa had set up and had a booth at the at the craft show. And um, we had two different ladies come along that said that their daughters were engineers and they just wanted, and they also quilted. So she, they both really wanted this shirt for their daughters. So does Kelly ever have time to sew with you knowing she has her hands full with kids and work? Okay, Kelly is my oldest daughter. She has Georgia who is three years old and she'll be four in April. And then she has twin boys that will be two in April. No? Georgia will be four in March. Georgia will be four the in March and the boys will be, will be two, two in April. April. When you have 10 grandkids, it gets harder. <laughs> Um, so Kelly doesn't get oftentimes to um, sew with me anymore and her house setup is really kind of hard and her boys are kind of rambunctious and would probably get into her sewing machine. So she hasn't been doing a lot of sewing. She did make pillowcases for them for Christmas. Oops, I mean Santa made <laughs> pillowcases for them for Christmas. And um, she's kind of moved more towards cross stitch. And the reason for that is, is that she can take her cross stitch items and she can put them in a bag and she can put the bag up high and nobody can get it. She'll be back to sewing sometime in her life. She, she misses it and um, wishes she had more time for it. But right now she's um, in a new chapter of her life that involves kids and a lot of mothering. So I went through that stage myself. Okay, Calissa is giving me the sign that I'm supposed to read one of the questions off of here. Um, Susan in Michigan, do you have sewing goals for the new year? Is there any advice you can give somebody for getting your, your sewing mojo back? I do have some sewing goals for the mo for the new year. Um, I want to keep working on my UFOs. If you've been following the blog, you know I've been doing the Dirty Dozen with Country Threads, and so a UFO comes up each month, and then you're supposed to work on that UFO. I've been kind of delinquent on working on the exact UFO they've been asking for, but I continue to work on UFOs, and I um, am really glad to have that motiv motivation to work towards finishing those. And um, I think, I don't know, I think I listed like 24, and I think I have six done. Um, I'm hoping I get more than that done though. So that's one of my goals. Um, my other goal is um, regarding YouTube. Hey, you guys, this is what I'm after. Um, not after, but I remember how I said I like the, the, the methodical part about sewing and I just like to feed pieces through the machine. I really don't care what I sew. I don't have this like grandiose idea that I've got a um, make some big applique quilt or something like that. I don't have like lofty sewing goals. My main goal is um, 
I really would like more people to learn to sew and feel comfortable with sewing. And so I've realized part of that has to happen through people who are willing to do YouTube videos and write blogs and do things like that so that more people can get on the sewing bandwagon and more people can get some of that methodical time that I get. So I just sewed together my big Iowa Hawkeyes quilt that was just these half square triangles. So my plan is, is that I'm going to try to do more simple quilts and share my ideas with you on YouTube. And I hope that that's something that you guys are looking forward to as well. So that's one of my quilting goals as well. And man, I'd like to keep my sewing room a little more clean. And I'd like to get caught up on my UFOs through the long arm because I have a lot of tops done, but I don't have a lot of tops finished. So do you have a question or am I me? Just a comment. If you want to help mom reach her goal on YouTube and you haven't actually like hit the subscribe button on YouTube and then they always say ring the bell. If you click on the little bell, that also is super helpful. It helps her get seen by more people, which is actually how we're getting a lot of our audience on YouTube. We're getting a lot of comments of people who are new to mom's blog and new to the videos. So thanks. I appreciate Welcome. it. Yes. Yeah. If you're new, welcome. Um, and if you're old, oh, thank goodness you can put up with me. <laughs> but I didn't answer the part here that how do I get my, that my sewing mojo back? And I'm going to be honest with you. My sewing mojo kind of does a whole roller coaster thing. And for me, you guys know if you um, watch my blog, you know that every Monday I have a Monday blog post and it's all about what I've been sewing. And sometimes it's like Saturday morning and I haven't sewed very much at all. And I tell myself, you aren't going to have a single thing to blog about if you don't get up there and sew something. So I get up there and sew and I thought, okay, I'll sew for half an hour and I'll get going and sewing for half an hour. And then pretty soon that half an hour turns into an hour, it turns into an hour and a half, turns into two hours. And then pretty soon I went, oh, whoops, I missed dinner. And so that happens to me often. And sometimes you just have to go up there and do it. And then something else is sometimes you need to make a goal for yourself. Like, I really want to get my UFOs done. I don't really need to do my UFOs, but it's just something that I have something to look forward to. I'm getting these UFOs checked off my list. So sometimes it's good to have something to look forward to. Um, and my other suggestion is sometimes it's better to walk away from your hobby for a little bit and do something else. And that's kind of what I've been doing a little bit with cross stitch too. So I cross stitch now a lot. And I still sew quite a bit. So I'm loving my sewing time and I'm loving my cross stitch time because I don't get bored when I'm sewing because there's more things to look at because I'm cross stitching at the same time or is cross stitching on different days. So I really love um, having two different things. So keep trying until you find um, a way to get your mojo back. And sometimes, you know, it's okay if it takes a break for six months. It's okay if it takes a break for a year. Um, just eventually get back to it when you're ready. And sometimes maybe having a goal like, well, I'm going to make a baby quilt for my great niece. Um, that might just be the thing that you need to get back in the sewing room. Have you ever crocheted or knitted? <clears throat> oh my goodness. When I was 16 years old, I think I tried every craft under the sun. So I, <laughs> I crocheted and knitted long enough. Um, it's when I was 16 or 17 and 15, sorry about the scanner. Um, I did at that time enough to know that I cannot figure out how to count a dang stitch. Um, I can crochet, I can make the line, I can flip over, I can do a double crochet, but I cannot go like to the third row because, or, you know, the second row, because I can't count stitches like they say, go over two and then, you know, can't do it. So I, I stopped that. Kayla has tried to convince me and she tried to show me how to crochet dishcloths, but I backed off from that too. I just, and then the other thing is when I hold it, I hold it too tight and my hand cramps up and I, yeah, nope. So crochet and knitting has not caught on with me. Speaking of Kayla, um, someone is wondering how Kayla is doing with her cross stitching. Okay. So Kayla is my second daughter. It goes Kelly and then Kayla, and then I've got two boys, Buck and Carl, and then Calissa. And so Kayla is my second daughter, and she has started to pick up cross stitch as well as Kelly. Um, Kelly is kind of going gangbangers, and Kayla kind of fits it in in, in between other things. Um, uh, so Kayla has been taking some pretty intense classes, um, computer-related classes, and she has not had a lot of time to cross stitch just lately, but I think she'll pick it back up again once 
um, her job status and things kind of settled down with her. She's kind of had a couple um, health bump in the roads that she's trying to figure out too. She's going to see an allergist on Friday. So hopefully that can help. Um, one more question about your African violets. Uh, do they have artificial light or natural light? Which windows are they close to? That's from Christy on YouTube. Um, my African violets are all in either west or south windows. And um, it's all natural light. And um, I'm, I'm not too picky about it. I don't have any windows really that would work to face east and I don't have any windows that would face north. So because of that, I have south, west, south and west. So I default to what I have. Okay, and I'm getting the sign that I need to answer a question from here. Um, could I expl please explain how I use working copies in cross stitch? Um, she's afraid to make a detailed project and lose her place. This is from Linda. And so, Linda, I grabbed a couple of things and I'm gonna show you how and why I make a working copy. So I am currently working on this piece. It's a Blackboard design piece and it's called We Live in Hope. And I kind of really picked this up about the beginning of December and started going to town on it and getting quite a bit more done. Just this week I did um, these three baskets and I'm working on this boat right now. This is a piece, uh, comm a commemorative piece for my um, uh, paternal grandparents. And so I, we're technically not supposed to show charts very much, but I'm gonna show this really fast and there's no way anybody can get the pattern off how fast I'm gonna show this. So this is one page of the pattern. This is another page of the pattern. Here's a piece and here's a piece to the pattern. Well, I am just terrible as far as visually being able to line those pieces up. So when I stitch something that has um, several pages to it, I make what I call a working copy. So this is my working copy. I copied those two pages here and then I copied those small pieces down here and I taped it all together. And um, you can see it's taped together on the back. And then I fold it, however, if I'm working up in this corner, I fold this and clip this into my holder, my chart holder. If I'm working on this corner, I fold it like this and I clip it up here and I'm working on this corner. And that's the reason why I make a working copy is because I don't have to visually in the book go from this page down over to this piece over here. And I don't have to do that because it's all together in one piece. Okay, so that's why I make a working copy. Also, it keeps my book nicer, and then I don't, I'm not crinkling my book and, and having problems with my book. And so a lot of other people, this is a pattern that Kelly did. And so you can see she made a working copy, and then she took a highlighter and she highlighted the spots that she had stitched. She was a new stitcher when she stitched this, and she, um, wanted to take a highlighter and highlight this areas that she had done. A lot of times when my working copy, I'll make a notation here or something and I'll say, um, substituted this color. I might make a note that says what kind of fabric I'm working on so I can remember that. Um, I just like having a working copy because visually it's easier for me to follow the big pattern. And um, it's, just, it's just what I like to do. And then on this one, I'm gonna be charting, or I probably have Kayla chart for me, my grandparents' names. And so I'm gonna take off some of these pieces here. So what we'll do is we'll just white out this area and then we'll put in information like um, the year that my grandparents immigrated from Sweden. And so we're gonna put that, I'm gonna put that year on there. And um, I can do that because I can just white out the areas that I don't want to. And I would never do that in my, in my book copy, but I would definitely do this on a working copy. So that's some of the reasons why I do use a working copy. Someone suggested, suggested that we make a shirt that says Rebel Quilter, which brings me to a question. We actually were thinking about making Joe's Country Junction t-shirts, and so you guys should leave a comment and let us know if you would get one if we did. Yeah. Would you buy a Rebel Quilter shirt, or would you buy a Joe's Country Junction shirt, or would you buy both, or would you buy none? We're not offended either way. <laughs> we just that was like a to cute know. idea. I like that. Yes. I, but I really do feel like I am a Rebel Quilter because... I've been in classes where um, 
teachers have been teaching something that they're supposed to talk about. And I've had sat in there and a lady held up the entire class for about 20 minutes because she was so concerned that her block was an eighth inch off. And my block is an eighth inch off probably 90% of the time. But when I sew them together and you see it on a big, huge quilt, you don't see that. You don't see that at all. And so after being in that class, I've just learned that you know, I just, I really don't adhere to many of the rules at all. I'm just a self-taught quilter and I'm just, I'm just fine with who I am with it. And so I really am a rebel quilter. So, um, someone also said, I'm really looking forward to your American patchwork and quilting quilts. Yes. In the magazine. Do you yes. want to tell a little bit more um, about that? I do have a quilt coming out in American Patchwork and Quilting, and it is going, it's a version of a orange peel quilt, and Calissa has um, done a lot of background work, and she's made acrylic templates that are going to be used with the quilt. It was, and you'll be able to order them from her. Um, information will be in the magazine, and I'm sure I'll have information on the blog as well. The quilt issue, the quilt was supposed to be in the anniversary issue of their 30th anniversary. American Patchwork and Quilting's 30th anniversary edition, which will be coming out, I think, in April. Uh, or maybe it's the April and it'll come out, you know, we'll start getting them early, probably um, end of February or March. But my quilt ended up getting moved back a month. I haven't even talked to you about this, sorry. Um, because the, so many people responded to um, wanting to be in the magazine. And so I said I didn't care if they moved my project. And so my project got moved to um, a later issue and um, I'm excited about it too because it's string pieced and I'll probably do um, some a YouTube video on how I string piece and how I made the pieces for it and um, how I pinned and do it then did all those things so watch for that coming up but probably not till June yeah and I don't have any more questions on the list I've been getting the eye from Calissa that um, I'm supposed to ask a question from the list. She goes, she sits over there and does this to me. And um, I have all the questions answered on my list. So I did really good. And it's just about an hour. So. Yeah. So we'll probably sign off. Um, Calissa's got to go home and wrangle the three boys. Um, Andrews is probably ready to be fed. And uh, Gannon hopefully is sleeping because he's been just a pistol lately. And um, Carver's been... Well, it's ready for school to start back again. I think we've all, all of us who have had kids have that, um, oh, Christmas Christmas break itch where you start to wonder, uh, are the kids going back to school yet? And that's about where Carver is right now. So they might need a little grandma time yet this week just to give Calissa a break. That's perfectly fine with me. So um, I don't have anything else to tell you. So I guess I'm going to sign off. Um, okay, so I guess I'll say goodbye from the Rebel Quilter. We just have a new tagline, I guess. Now. Yes, yes. Goodbye from the Rebel Quilter. I do have, uh, Calissa's going to load up a YouTube video. It's going to be a floss tube video coming up uh, probably in the next couple days. Um, I filmed it today, but we've kind of got a busy schedule as far as getting it edited and loaded. And remember, we want to not put all those ads in there. So it's going to take a little tweaking for us to figure out how to get that done without putting the ads in there. And because, you know, we're slow learners, but that's okay. Calissa's not. I'm the slow learner. I, I'll be honest. I don't learn at all. I just depend on her. <laughs> we have a great relationship though and she's she's really good about it so thank you so much for joining me um i won't see you in this in 2022 so have a happy new year and um, i hope we can get together again for another facebook live um just kind of start asking questions and once we get a few questions we'll just plan another one so does i actually have kind of fun doing this so See you later. And I get new tag names. The Rebel Quilter. So, <laughs> so many people are loving the Rebel Quilter. See you later. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Okay, now what do I do? Okay, you're ended on Facebook. YouTube's still hanging around. Okay. Bye, YouTube. We're ending. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know how to end it.